Hello, and welcome to I'll Try That, the beer review and news podcast. I'll Try That, the beer review and news podcast. Here in London. Ding dong. I was thinking about this last night in bed. Smashed it. <laughs> Proof of success. There's a soon to be a fur daddy. <laughs> Another one in the bag. I'm vetoing that. <laughs> This week, in the pursuit of happiness, we're going to be talking AB and Bev and the King of Beers, Budweiser. But first, the hop topic. Let's get stuck into the hop topic. Okay, so I'm bringing some good news to the podcast. Have you guys heard of the All Dogs Matter charity that is set up in 2009? No, I haven't. But you must have heard of Brewdog. Yes. So you've heard of Brewdog, I would say probably one of our favourite brewers out there. So they are collabing together, which you wouldn't really think about uh, or consider it a, a collab that's going together. But what they're doing is, with the helps of Ricky Gervais and Pete Egan, who are keen supporters of this, they're going to be putting labels on their IPA drinks of dogs that are up for adoption in the local area cute that's amazing and then what they'll do is they're also doing combining with pause to rescues and all of the money that they raise from these cans are going to be split between the two charities that's absolutely amazing i love it yeah i think as as things go that's uh, so cool i mean as the name brew dog dog is quite literally in the name this is the first i've heard of them supporting dog charities and dog adoptions and i know the likes of ricky gervais for example is a big animal advocate so as a future fur daddy joe <laughs> How does it feel? I would say anything that helps dogs find owners is a fantastic thing to get behind. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I love that. So Brewdog are urging you to pre-order all of these beers because, as I said, 100% all of the proceeds are going to these charities. I also forgot to mention Animal Asia as well is involved in there. So the money's going overseas as well so these are like special beers that, do you have to buy them online you can pre-order the beers from the brew dog website and each beer will have a different sticker printed on the side of it and they're called street dog punk ipa i love the fact that they're using their name so well in that as in so brew dog is such a big name now especially in the uk it's just going to be wildfire especially because everyone hey, it sounds bad but you put a dog or a puppy in front of something you're going to sell it. Woof, woof. <laughs> and now for some Pursuit of Hoppiness. Pursuit of Hoppiness. Pursuit of Hoppiness. So this week, we're talking AB and Bev and Budweiser. Now, before we get into Budweiser, we have to talk about the behemoth that is AB and Bev and how AB and Bev came to existence, because not many people know that AB and Bev is this monolithic, ginormous beer making and money making company. So, talking of, of AB and Bev, actually, they claim on their website, which I do happen to believe is, is there's an element of truth here, but it started out uh, over 800 years ago by monks. And there's a little known Belgian beer called Lefe. Little, little known. Little known. Probably the most popular Belgian beer out there. Um, and this is the, the beer that for them started the Anheuser which is the first part of AB and Bev. The story of Budweiser, America's most famous beer, comes from Belgium. Started by Ebdehard Anheuser. Good, good. You're doing a good job. Well done, mate. Yeah, yeah. One one more time. Okay. Started by Ebdehard. No, Eberhard. That's not even that hard to say. (laughs) (laughs) I put a D in it. We would like to apologise for anybody who does have that name. (laughs) I think Ebdehard has gone out the word. I'm not even saying it right now. <laughs> Ebdehard. I'm just calling it, going to call him Anheuser. If there's anybody... Mr. Called, Anheuser. Mr. Okay, yeah. Okay. Keep it yeah, formal. Okay. Keep it formal. Yeah. That's the way to do it. Keep it formal. That's the way. Okay. I'll just do the whole bit again. <laughs> who was actually a soap merchant who took control of a Bavarian brewing company, so German, South German brewing company, after it defaulted on a loan in 1860. And you might be wondering where Adolphus Bush comes in. Adolphus Busch was actually one of the trade suppliers who supplied the brewery and fell in love with Anheuser's daughter, Lily, and took over ownership or came into, took a stake in the business. So that's where Anheuser-Busch originally comes from. So, I mean, it's like literally the, the very early stages of succession. 
you know you can think about that where there's like the the guys owning the business created this big business and then a new like generation so i think it's going to be hard with this not to be a bit of a history lesson uh yeah. with this episode because yeah. anheuser bush ab and bev today has gone through so many changes and so many existence in to become this world monolithic brewer so simo why don't you tell us a bit more about the mergers and the key points of the mergers just to kind of set the scene at the time anheuser bush is that was the large this is in the 2000s was the largest brewery com- company in the united states in bev uh, was the second largest bre- brewery company in the world and they combined around in the 2000s now this seems to me an absolutely massive deal because you're monopolizing the entire market um, because InBev were huge in Latin America um, and they also had places in Belgium. And then you've got Anna Hauser who are huge in the United States and in Belgium. And then, then they also merged with Ambev, which is a huge Brazilian beverages company in the 2000s. And, and they kind of brewed for the entirety of South America. And then to put on top of that... They also merged with Interbrew, which at the time were the third largest brewing company in the world. So to put this in perspective, you've got the first, second and third biggest brewing companies in the world coming together as well as the one that's the biggest in South America. So That's crazy. Under that as well, they also took on even more in the 2000s, like slightly smaller ones. Uh, but they've got the Mexico Grupo Modelo. I think that's how you the pronounce Modelo it. Group. The Modelo Group, yeah. Mm-hmm. South Korea's Oriental Brewery and the Sab Miller came to unite under the AB InBev umbrella as well. Yeah, SAB Miller was the, one of the largest brewing companies in the world that went under. They basically okay. got bought out by different... That's where Asahi is now in the in Europe because yeah. of SAB, buying their SAB Miller Europe. Oh, okay. The big mergers and acquisitions of much larger organizations, yes, smaller companies, smaller pieces that get brought up all the time for technologies, for... We see it a lot in the tech industry. Where you know the likes of Google will buy a company because they're doing something that they and they decided that they don't want to invest that they'd rather invest the money in buying a company and owning that IP and that product than to than to develop it themselves. When it comes to the big players, where you're basically buying out a competitor, it's because you want to enter into a new market. You want to own a new market area, market share. Coke's a great example. Look at their huge portfolio of products in one country and then global countries. You know, they have Coke's different in that they have specific, like you can buy a Coke product anywhere in the world where Coke is sold, but they have individual, they have local jewels is what it's called, where you have a product that sells really well in a specific country, market, whatever you want to call it. Like that's, and then that's that where you'll see the buying up of those smaller local products. PepsiCo is is another monolith, but it's also got an even better example of how they really buy up those local jewels so you can buy specific owned products that are owned by pepsi but you'd never know it's owned by pepsi so so why do you think they've managed to last so long though so they've been going for 800 years plus i mean we're still talking about ab and bev right yeah we haven't even yeah. gone on to budweiser properly yet no yeah so um I mean, they've kept themselves in nearly every country now. So, so they've made sure they're a presence and they're essentially making revenue in every avenue of the world. And they've worked up tirelessly on volume. So yeah. making mm-hmm. enough volume of beer so you can get hold of their products. That's cool. I just, I just found some interesting stuff. So if you go back in time a bit to when it was just Anheuser-Busch, mm-hmm. when it first started out, was um, except they, they went through the prohibition period. So how do you reckon they, they, they survived that? Because I've got, I've got some the great stuff here. stats. I think, I, from my understanding, but especially from the spirit world, is that they would put it. They'd get a <laughs> spirit license. World. Oh, sorry. sorry, spirits. Yeah, yeah I've got. Yeah, they're just they're using Ouija boards to contact <laughs> yeah. the dead. Just been hanging out in but um, how a lot of distillers around Kentucky were able to stay afloat, like the big ones, like Jim yeah. Beams and uh, um, Maker's Mark, is because they were able to get a license from the government to say it was for medicinal purposes. So you know what the interesting thing? An- Anaheiser Bush were a bit ahead of their time when it comes to how they survived. Was they started to pump out non-alcoholic products to keep themselves afloat through the prohibition period? Interesting. Okay. So I was reading this, going back to kind of AB and Bev as a company, found this on their website, which I had to say, I had to read it out on this podcast for you guys and get your reaction to this. Okay. Okay. So so they proudly state that the history of AB and Bev is a global story that spans continents and generations. It's not just our history. It's the history of beer itself. Wow. Okay. That that is a bold statement. 
Very bold statement. <laughs> they're, they're, they're claiming to be the history of all beer. They are beer. They are beer. If you they think beer, beer ev- wherever you are in the world, whoever you are, Anheuser, AB and Bev. Yes, their company is part of and is interwoven into a lot of countries because of the beer that they sell. Like, So, for instance, I know that some examples of their products, like obviously Budweiser, then Le Bat Blue, which is in Canada. You've got Corona, which is a huge company that everybody knows about. You've got Bex, you've got Brahma. Modelo. A mate like this. Stella Artois. And they've got Castle Lager, which I actually knew about, which is the South African lager. You've mm-hmm. also got Cass Fresh, which is South Afri- South uh, Korean, sorry. And you've got, obviously, Ho Garden, Jup- uh, Jupiler. Jupiler. Have you, have you seen I, that I one? I'm going to leave I that know, out there. I know what you're trying to it's say. It's the one with the bull on <laughs> it. It's the one with the bull on it. I would say their products would be what is their ne- they're famous for. Like I wouldn't know that AB... I wouldn't go, oh, I'm having a Budweiser, AB and Bev. Mm-hmm. I would actually just go, I'm having a Budweiser. Well, I'd not heard of AB and Bev till we talked about it last on a couple of podcasts ago. So that's all new to me. I knew of their beers and what they'd created, but I'd never heard of the actual company themselves. So that nicely brings us to let's talk about Budweiser. Yeah. This is what we're drinking right now. This is what we're... This is their The King of Beers. As, as, as Joe gathers gas... <laughs> It's the king of gas. <laughs> it is a gassy beer. I, I do get actually quite burpy. Do you want to talk I... about the liquid? Let's do it. I'm, I'm going to put it out there. It's, it's standard. It's what you expect from a lager. Right. So it's through and through a lager. Yeah. It couldn't be anything else. It's not surprising when you drink it. It's nice, but it's not going to blow me away. And I'm not going to go out of my way to rave about it would be I, the best way. to. Th- my initial thought of this, this is a very Western take on a lager. We've had as of late, quite a few Asian lagers. Yeah. yeah. And taken up, uh, take, yeah, <laughs> in unison there. <laughs> Love that. Um, we've, t- you know, where you're taking this brewing process or the from Belgium, Germany, and you're exporting it over into the Asian markets for Asian taste buds. Yeah. This is, it's like it's never left home. Although it's like the American version now, as we know it, because of the marketing that's gone behind it, uh, specifically in the US, and we'll talk about that and how that influence into the rest of the world, but this is through and through like a Belgian, German styled beer. So we say yes. Uh, so... <laughs> we say what, Rich? <laughs> uh, okay. So we said we we've been talking about the flavour and how it's a very it, it's not it's it's a nice flavour, but it's not out of this world. It's not going to re, re, redefine things. Uh, but Budweiser claims to have used the same five ingredients from the original recipe from. Adipose Bush. That's very I'm wrong. that you also tried to say <laughs> his name. <laughs> um, yeah. Adolfo. What? Adolfo Bush. Is it Adolfo or Adolfo? Let's have a look. Where is it? Adolphus. 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 Adolphus Bush. So he claim, Adolphus. they claim to use the same five ingredients from Adolphus Bush from when it was originally brewed, which is um, water, barley, yeast, hops, and rice. But that's beer. That's what beer yes. is. Yes. Let's put into context that there's this macro brewery around the world. It's having a consistent product globally. So yes. you can pick this up anywhere. It's like what McDonald's try and do with their burgers. You can pick up the same, you can know what you're ordering and you know what you're going to get. Yeah. And that is a huge monumental task. You know, think about all the, the, the different things that go into brewing, you know, water, the, uh, you know, the type of water that you're getting, yeah. you know, the quality of the water, the hops themselves and the, you know, there's, there's so many yeah. things within a supply chain that you have to control as well. Not even putting into consideration, you know, the, where you're brewing the beer itself. You're brewing in Asia and the, the different environment and climate for how you're brewing it. So the fact that they've been able to make a consistent product globally with all those different vari- variables and different conditions, I think in itself is a huge monumental feat. Looking at the can, like we, we're having canned Budweiser at the moment, not bottled, but I think that I haven't seen it change its design style, its color scheme. I might be wrong, but I'm glad you said that. Chris. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> but as in, like, as in, I, as in, I know Budweiser as red and white. Yeah, with so. the, with the scrawly writing. As in, that is what I know Budweiser to be. Joe, please do tell. No, I love that. That's exact. That's a great stepping point. Red, white, absolutely. They're ownable colors by Budweiser. If you're gonna have a Budweiser rebrand or a refresh of their design they're going to stay with those colors but if you look at all the and the typeface itself hasn't really changed you know they have had the scrawly writing has changed ever so slightly but do you ever remember in the last can iteration there might have been a big bow tie do you ever remember seeing that and the fact that the bow tie is gone and you didn't remember there was a bow tie on it showed that it wasn't a 
asset that, that they, they needed, equity that they needed in the Canada more. How long ago was the bow tie? This, this, this design that you see in Budweiser's all around the world now. Was it slightly scroll-like? Yeah, it see, was scroll, it was on an angle, this. and that was yeah. part of the design of the of the Budweiser can for, gen- I would say, like over like 40 years. Well, that's it. Well, it was it was a bow tie shape. I wouldn't say it like, looked like a bow tie. Yeah. It, was yeah. just, it was a bow tie shape. But what they've done with this design, it's you can see on the on the can. It's a global thing. They've literally called out Australia, Africa, America, Asia, Europe around this. What could be a compass, a compass style with the AB? Because it's now linking back to AB and Bev for the very yeah. first time on the can. I've just spotted the bow tie is on it. Yeah. yeah, but it's round on the side and it's just got Budweiser written through it. Yeah. Now, now I look. At now that. I look at that yeah. shape. Now I know what you're talking about. What is it that you, you said that AB and Bev said that they are a worldwide company? I mean, they're pretty much telling you they are with that compass and with the fact that every single continent that they go to mm-hmm. is on there, and they're kind of they're basically emphasising to anyone who buys them that we're a big deal. Yeah. They're the owners and the creators of Budweiser, trying to link back to that story and just say, look, you know Budweiser. Yeah. You know and interact with the brands. They're just trying to create a new story to link back to their history. And this is what is relevant to people. I've only known Budweiser through sport. And that's how I was first introduced to the idea of drinking Bud was actually through sport because it was advertising sport all the time. But it was always through their adverts. <laughs> yeah, And the way they used to market themselves absolutely fantastically mm. they they have some of the best adverts I think. exactly <laughs> exactly the waza <laughs> <What's laughs> and do you remember the frog swan the bud why <laughs> that one yeah. that was insane that was so good and I'll, we'll link all of these up because we I, I i enjoyed going back through yeah finding yeah these and they're like from the mid 90s the waza the frog one was from the mid 90s the waza was from the 2000s yeah what was the one did they also do the one with the horse and the dog becoming friends so i'm glad you we'll t- we need to talk sports sponsor yeah. sports sponsorships but while we're talking about adverts themselves Clydesdales. Yeah. These are the horses, and this is like. Can you? You need to explain this for me. So Clydesdales are such an a, an important piece of their marketing. It's like you know how Coke is synonymous with that that Christmas ad. You know the one where Coca Cola trucks driving through. You know with all the lights on, they drive through the snow yeah. like villages, whatever. So Clydesdale is like for anyone outside of the US, because if you're in the US, you're going yeah, like Budweiser Clydesdale horses, of course. Whereas outside of the US, you need to know that that is like so synonymous with it. So Clydesdales actually just big, big horses, like the biggest horses that you can get. Well, it'd be in the UK like a Shire horse sort of size. Or Suffolk Punch, yeah. Clydesdales are an integral part of the brand's marketing since 1933. Wow. So the initial six, there's always six of them. The initial team of six Clydesdales were given to Anheuser-Busch as a, a celebration of the repeal of Prohibition. Okay. The selection criteria to, and an interview process of becoming one of Aunt Budweiser's Clydesdale horse is like really, really hard. So, so, so originally, I'm guessing these were used to actually transfer the alcohol. Is that the... I think that was alluded yeah. to. They've yeah, always yeah. been ceremonial yeah. in that sense. Like okay. it's just been part of the brand. Yeah. Can, can you wouldn't I... actually have a whole team of Clydesdales actually delivering all that beer all the time. In 1933, oh, okay. they're cars <laughs> then. They're <laughs> tanks. <laughs> What are you talking about? Wait, can, I, can I just go back quickly? Did you say interviewing the horse's positions? Yes. Okay, so the actual horse, not the driver. We're not. Simo's put this in your head that they're actually delivering the beer by the horses. That <laughs> no, doesn't no, 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 happen. No, no. I get, I, I get no, that no, the horses are a show thing to go yeah, back yeah, with yeah. history and stuff like that. Yeah, so I'll paint you a picture. So they sit the horses down in a, in a, <laughs> behind a table and say, thank you very much, Mr. Clydesdale, for coming in. I've read your resume. <laughs> I like what you what I see. Can you tell us more about a challenge or a difficult occasion that you've overcome and why you've done it? No, it doesn't happen like that. It's not, it doesn't happen like that. It's basically a quite literally visual um, and also kind of how they act as horses. How objective? Yeah, it is. It's it's yeah. like they have to have a specific amount of white on their feet. So like oh, a, I example. see. So it'd be like a beauty pageant, but for horses. So it's like crufts for yeah. horses. I mean, do you fit the Clydesdale Budweiser brand? Yeah. You were saying how you both think of Budweiser, you think of sports. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There have been a lot of talk about how they used their sponsorship of sports to dominate the US beer market. So they're the biggest sponsor in sport for almost 40 years in the US. Over 40 years. Crazy. Four decades. So they've, they've been the biggest sponsor in sport. So from 1980 onwards, they've been dominating the whole the system. Yeah. That's absolutely crazy. Yeah. And they've spent in just one year alone, just 2016, they spent 350 million 
dollars on sports sponsorship. Wow. Which is a fraction of its obviously annual revenues of forty five point five billion of that year. <laughs> How but much? Forty five point five billion. Just billion. a few, mate. Just a few. <laughs> That's yeah. the annual revenues in that year. Crazy. But to get, but put it into an actual stat that really shows how big this is. You know, at one point they had sponsorship of ninety percent of all professional teams, all professional teams in the US, and twenty five consecutive years of Super Bowl sponsorship. Talking about advertising the Super Bowl. Uh, we, one of their advertisements was Brewed the Hard Way uh, that was advertised and aired during the Super Bowl XLIX. Which no one would ever use those Roman numerals in that way, which is what, what is it, fact checker? What's XLIX? 49, yeah. 49. Okay, so the 49th um, Super Bowl, uh, where they touted themselves as proudly a macro beer. I mean, to be able to do that, I think, is a big deal, the way that they've kind of pushed their... The fact that they're not saying we're not micro, we don't need to be micro. We are a huge company, and we know it. And I think that's and the fact that to be advertising the Super Bowl, you have to have a lot of money as well. Oh yeah, I mean each one of those spots is a million. Is that it's known as the most expensive airtime in in TV history, and it's like thirty seconds as well. It's yeah, know, I think people pay millions for that thirty second spot. <laughs> People just watch the Super Bowl for the advert. We had Super Bowl parties where people there would be a surge of people coming up to watch the Super Bowl ads. Each year they do a lottery. So one, you can submit your TV spot to this lottery. I don't know who picks it. And one of them will get, you'll get a 30, 30 second free spot. So it's it's trying to encourage the smaller brands. Yeah. Who's that, so like last, I think it was either last year or the year before, like Crack and Rum or won, won it yeah. and that's you know owned by Proximo Spirits but it's it was like they would never have spent that much money no. on it they're fun uh, honestly the adverts like a halftime shows at, at Super Bowl are a lot of fun they're really interesting it's not like we get like the perfume ads around Christmas where they're just like you don't, what is this what are we watching it's come to my essence my flavour <laughs> my time <laughs> <laughs> just get highly confused watching them <laughs> I think but I don't <laughs> <laughs> who are we but we are <laughs> So we're going to talk about sustainability, and for AB InBev, 2025 is going to be a very big year. So they're, because all of their goals across sustainability have to be done by 2025. I don't want to be part of their sustainability team in that year. That will be crazy. High stress. Right, so I'm going to do a really quick rundown of what their, tar- their targets are okay. for 2025. Go. Agricultural goal, 100% of their direct farmers will be skilled, connected, and financially empowered. Water goal, 100% of communities in high-stress water areas will have measurably improved water availability and quality. Packaging to be 100% returnable and made from majority recycled content. Climate, 100% of purchased electricity from renewable sources and have 25% reduced carbon emissions across supply chain. (gasps) Amazing. Congratulations. Talking community with AB and Bev, they've got some interesting stats for you. So I've got... 20,000 plus farmers work with them globally. They have created in 2019 6,200 jobs and they have made sure that businesses are supported via small retailer development and program and that number is 15,000. They also have nearly half of their breweries in the US are led by female brewmasters, they're called, which is quite cool. So for a community, they do a lot. For being such a big company, they make sure that they are still doing stuff for the community and the people they work for. Well, isn't it? They've also donated over 74 million cans of water for disaster relief since 1988. All right. Fact checker. Give us a fact. All right. All right. So they have a dispute with a Czech brewer called Budajovsky Budvar. Wow. That was impressive. That, well that was done, very man. impressive. You don't know how many, how many takes that has taken me to say. <laughs> Um, claim the Budweiser name is it's to use. So in the EU, Budweiser is Bud. And in US, uh, Budvar is Czechvar. 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 Not as catchy as Bud. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I think I know who lost out on that one, if I'm honest. <laughs> Good thing to note always is their numbers. So Instagram, global reach of 441,000 people. Twitter, 211,000 people. Which, as you'd imagine, yeah. 211, that's, you know, they're a global organization. So, as always, we'll put the links in the description for the AB and Bev website and the social medias, Instagram and Twitter. I'd say follow the company because they are really fascinating in what they're doing and they are putting so much money behind. It's really like interesting marketing that's behind it. The beer itself is very middle of the road. 
Yes. And that's all we have time for from this week's episode of the I'll Try That podcast. And so from me, Joe, Rich, and Simo, goodbye. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and watch us on YouTube. Goodbye now. Always drink responsibly. And if you or anyone else needs some help, go to drinkaware.co.uk for more information. Thank you.